<laughs> All right, so we're gonna. This is that's a that's a, a great point to to head into this next big truth about what I've learned through doing this work. You know, I start from this cognitive side, the thinking. That was what it was all about. And I had no intention when I wrote Minds Online of having a chapter on motivation. I'll just say that. Um, not in the proposal, not on my radar, because while I'm a psychologist, you know, we all have our disciplinary micro focus, and to me that, that was just out of my lane and I wasn't gonna bring it in. But I had the, the crisis and the meltdown midway through putting that book together. There's, there's something kind of missing here about how, the, how all this happens. And this is one of the kind of crossroads that I think is, is one of the things that's most exciting for carrying this through in the future, is what are some of these intersections between motivation and cognition? Because a lot of these things, like the quizzing effect, the testing effect, um, you know, these, these deep thinking exercises we want students to do and that they need to do if they're gonna get any better. All this stuff is not easier. It's harder, and sometimes it's even kind of emotionally challenging. We talked about some emotional aspects, for example, of, of um, learning to, to produce speech in a language. And it, they have a video over here that's, that's fabulous at breaking that down, by the way. If you get, get a chance to, to see that and share it, it it's, it's really great. Um, so all of these things impact on whether students are going to be able to do these things. And you know, other emotional barriers, by the way, that retrieval practice and testing effect, I mean, it's really, really good when we build that into our courses, but of course we want students to do that on their own too. Why do they not do it? Well, I think one of the reasons is that it's kind of threatening. It's a lot easier to kind of skim and go, oh yeah, I got that and I got this, when you need to be focusing on the parts that you didn't get. And it's hard to sit down, take that quiz, and feel uncomfortable as a result. So I've now come around to this, this way of thinking that these two things do have to work together. And while I'm never suggesting that we have to be rah-rah or entertaining at every moment, I think that we do at least have to have a reflection and a plan about how motivation is gonna happen. So we're actually gonna start here with what I think is a really great thought exercise. Sometimes I call this the best of times and the worst of times, and I got this from my own very brilliant faculty professional development director, Larry Gallagher, who posed this to me once and, and said what a great exercise this is. So it starts with reflecting back on our own education, our own higher ed uh, experiences. So I want everybody to be thinking about some different combinations here, all right? So we all had these different, we all signed up for classes for different reasons. And you know, there's classes where we're, we said, oh, I'm really wanting to take this. I wanna take biological anthropology. I really wanna take British literature. This is my thing. And you took it, you were motivated from the get-go and it worked out great. But then there are those other classes where you thought, uh, you signed up for it because it fits your schedule, it was a prereq, you had no interest in X, but you got there and you turned out to be really, really motivated in that class or something that engaged you. So in my case, it was a class on, um, on physical pain, <laughs> um, which I had to take as part of my behavioral neuroscience side of my degree. It had nothing to do with theoretical psycholinguistics, which is what I went to grad school in, and it was just fascinating. I think we all have those as well. And then there's the, the not so fun flip side. You were dying to take class X. You got there and oh my gosh, what a slog. So we have those experiences. If you wanted to really get crazy, you can even put this in a, in a grid. Um, your interest going in and your motivation, right? High and low. And I think it's very telling in particular, of course, to, to look at those those two mismatches. So let's think for a second. Anybody would like to, to share their own experience about the class that you had no interest going in, you got there, and you were motivated. So what was that class for you, and what do you think that was about? Yeah, come back. Oh. For me, Art history, okay. I didn't think that I would see anything <laughs> in an art history course except <laughs> pictures. Yeah. And um, the, the woman who taught it 
um, gave us a book. It was by Fossillon, I think is how you pronounce the guy's name. Um, mm -hmm. But he talked about the forces that led to change in art. And um, I'm a social scientist, and mm -hmm. 50 years later, I can still go back and think about some of the forces that he said were crucial, mm -hmm. like he said about the elements and the economy mm -hmm. and you know, sort of schools of art um, and how ideas progress in art. And all of those things mm -hmm. happen in the career that I'm in now. And um, the, also the lady who taught it, um, showed it, did show us a lot of pictures, and I, I yeah. liked them, and uh, <laughs> okay. um, so on. You, you had pictures up about, oh. you know, <laughs> yeah. um, Degas and stuff, and I never could get those, yeah. but I got the basic ideas yeah. of uh, what were the forces that this man, Fossillon, a French historian, mm -hmm. I guess, art historian, thought yeah. were the, the key drivers of change in art. Oh. And, and it's been very, I was fascinated by it then, and it's been very useful. All right, so you were expecting a kind of superficial, here's, here's some pictures, they're nice. It, you were introduced to a conceptual structure that really drew yes, you in. Okay, yeah. good. What are and, some and other? And it was a required course. And I mean, it was a required course. It, requ requ it met a requirement, let's put it that way. It wasn't, I could have taken yeah. other courses, but it was a, a kind of thing where I had to take one of X. You had to take one of X, yeah. Three cheers for Jed Ed. All right, uh, do we have another experience? I forget where I saw another hand. Who would like to share? Oh, okay, we have some uh, share here. I, yeah, thank you. I took an advanced Spanish grammar course and I, uh, I just assumed it was going to, you know, be uh -huh. hell. <laughs> <laughs> and in a way it was, but for some reason, the, the way it was handled, we had to do a lot of chalkboard problems where we had to translate and get the language exactly right and the nuances of doing that were kind of celebrated but at the same time the tension was very high and, and there was a lot of uh, approval or disapproval and mm -hmm. so for some reason it became very exciting <laughs> even though it was tension ridden to get okay. it right you felt okay. every time you went up to the board <laughs> <laughs> that you know you're doing a happy dance so I don't know right. kind of crazy some, some sense of, of almost competition suspense great yep. I, I get excited about um, so this is sort of more than one class or whatever but things that um, uh, give you a different lens on, on the world and, and really force you out of um, sort of just I remember when I was doing my doctorate in education, a lot of the stuff seemed like it was just sort of layering, and then this one class just kind of blew everything up and, and talked about social justice issues and all kinds of other stuff that everybody else was sort of just building on stuff, and this was a whole different way of looking at everything. Um, and um, I've, I've done some books for the American Library Association, and the editor I work with over there, um, that's how she sort of frames things. She likes to, to get books that'll force librarians to look at things in different ways than they have thought of in the past. Um, and, but, but see, I don't know if, I wonder though if the things that excite us are the same things that excite the student who just wants to, you know, I just want to get my career going, I just, you know, that. The novelty, I'm novelty was definitely an underlying theme of both of those. Well, let, let's look at the, uh, the, the less happy quadrant here, okay. <laughs> You, you really were interested in learning about X, and you got there and no, it, this, this class was, was a slog, you were unmotivated. The same person, by the way, who was in this other class and was super motivated. All right, so anybody game to share one of, one of those experiences? It looked so good in the catalog, and then... Yes, okay, very good. Um. Mine was a college geometry class. I, I love math, and I was always really good at it when I was young. And okay. I, I was coming in, so I was really excited about this college geometry class, and it was just boring. <laughs> 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 well, we just didn't do anything, but you know, there was no hands-on. Okay. I think that's what it was. It was the first time I ever took a science class or a math class that wasn't hands-on. It was. Just, <sighs> let's, let's watch the math unfolding on the board, kind of thing. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. And I even say, I still had the textbook just oh. to remind myself. 
just to remind <laughs> yourself. Very good. All right. We have uh, we have another. Okay. I was going to say that the teacher really matters. You know, I uh -huh. thought okay. I was going to love a class, and I didn't love the teacher, and hence I didn't love the class because I didn't love the teacher, for whatever reason, maybe because they were boring or or whatever it was. So mm -hmm. I think the teacher makes a huge difference. Okay. All right, so we're saying the, the interaction with the teacher was what it was all about. And did we have, did we have another? Uh, yes. Okay, very good. Mm. Well, these are two classes. One, take, okay. one taken right before, this is in high school. Uh, uh, one, uh, one was geometry and the other one was trigonometry. And I thought you could tr geometry was going to be uh, very exciting and it was totally boring and I was totally fascinated with trigonometry and uh, through my lifetime I virtually made a living based on those two courses. So. Now, you know with this thought experiment it, the point isn't actually what all these have in common. I don't know that they do have necessarily themes in common but the point is more the complexity and a little bit of the nuance. Now, if you, imagine you're having that conversation um, with somebody about, oh, why aren't, why aren't students motivated? Or what motivates your students? <coughs> and think about some of the more superficial answers you'd get. So, so if you just kind of throw this question out to faculty member on the street, what are some of the things people say about motivation? Students are, what motivates students? Grade, okay? Yeah, you hear grade, incentive. There you go. And I, I and yeah? Praise. Praise, okay. So you hear praise, grades. I, I, I've heard it, yeah? Very applicability. If I can't mm -hmm. see how something is going to be potentially useful to me, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes this will be more cynically framed when we're talking about our students, the applicability piece with, you know, oh, they want, they want a job. They, they want to be able to do this thing for money. Okay. I, I mean, I, and I like this too because it has us critically examine that idea of interest. So, a priori interest, because I've heard that one a lot too. Well, they're either interested in trigonometry or they're not, and I can't do anything about that. They're either interested in developmental psychology, art history, computer science, or they're not. And yeah, pre-existing interest is probably important, but as this kind of demonstrates for us, it's definitely not the only factor. And I think that we, we do ourselves a disservice when we kind of stop there, when we stop with interest, or if we stop with grade, or even something like praise. There is a lot that goes into human motivation, and it's also very situation-driven. Just like we, we, we're probably wrong to think of students as they can think or not, depends on context. Well, of course we're wrong to think of students as motivated kid or unmotivated kid, right? Depends on where they are and what some of the conditions are around them. So if I could share out some of the uh, kind of biggest take homes and, and highlights of what we know about human motivation. All right, being very upfront that I'm not a motivation psychologist, but when I kind of looked at it from, from this um, direction, here's some of the things that were um, kind of the dominant in the research literature and also have some pretty clear connections to motivation in higher education context specifically. Now, of course, there's incentives, and probably most of you have, if you haven't studied it, you've heard of the classic findings on extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. And I think that's a good one to know. Here, too, though, it's easy to kind of oversimplify and say, well, you know, extrinsic is bad and we just want with complex lives, um, you know, intrinsic and extrinsic can, can complement each other. So, yeah, I'm probably not going to have good abiding motivation in a class where I'm just there to earn the grade and pass, but maybe, you know, I'm not interested in statistics, and yeah, I really want to pass statistics, but that ties to something that's very intrinsically motivating to me. That's how I can take my advanced developmental psychology course. That's how I can earn the degree, become the school psychologist, and help kids, which is what I really want that far out. Um, so that's okay. We don't want to make extrinsic motivation 
necessarily a dirty, a dirty word. It's all right to have points motivating students along the way. But again, it's not, it's not the stopping point. And both of those things are probably, honestly, in play in a lot of the everyday things that where we're, we're motivated to do something or not, extrinsic and intrinsic. Now, self-determination theory was another big one on the scene that gave us, it doesn't really compete with these others, but um, it's another kind of way to look at what are the conditions under which we're motivated, we put in effort, or we're not. And uh, what I like about these are, these are conditions that can be set in a lot of different um, environments, including our courses. So Daisy and Ryan um, point out that there's really these, these three conditions, which can look very different ways, but you know, these three things tend to turn us into that motivated person. So first off, competence, feeling like, hey, I'm good at this. Even if I'm not, if I'm not perfect or crushing it all the time, I'm getting there, right? And if you've ever been in that class where day one you felt like, wow, I'm just totally lost, I'll never be able to do X. That, that's always what did it for me. Those were the classes that, that I thought were cool, but then I dropped them. I'm like, well, I can't succeed in this, right? So I have some competence. Relatedness, that social piece, right? So it's not just me together, but like when you describe going up to the board and we're all gonna say, oh my gosh, did she get this Spanish grammar thing right or not? That sounds like relatedness to me. Other people are kind of recognizing and saying, yeah, we're all working towards this and we can see that. But also, at the same time, some autonomy. So autonomy and choice, not totally unregulated choice in everything, but feeling like, hey, I, I have some agency here. I'm not just, okay, here's what you have to do today and I have to follow that. So that last one is pretty intriguing when we think about it with, with our courses. So I wanna throw that one out for examples as well. So can anybody think of examples where they, as a student, felt autonomy? in a class or learning environment. So where did you feel like, yeah, I, I, I had that sense of I'm in charge. I get, I get some choice, I get to choose. Any, any uh, examples of conditions that set autonomy? Yeah. Well, sometimes when I, I had a, a class, a conversation class in Spanish, mm -hmm. um, we had some topics mm -hmm. we could talk about and they chose. They chose the topic, mm -hmm. and they love to do that. Yeah. Yeah. They were the ones to say, we're going to talk about this next mm -hmm. class, and yeah. they prepare, and they do that. All right, so choosing your own topic. I mean, that's probably the one that we would see the most and would be the most typical. It's not the only one, but even that, that's an example of autonomy, all right? Um, so uh, we, we have autonomy. Um, it, there's actually some re research that even suggests that even the wording choices you have in your syllabus, provided they're reading the syllabus, even the wording choices can kind of subtly imply that you're in charge. So you know, you're going to choose this, and here's why you may want to do this, and here's why I'd like you to do that. That can imply autonomy versus students will this, and students will that, okay? Does it transform it completely? Probably not, but you know, wording choices are, are easy things and cheap things to tweak. So even that can help set that set that condition. Yes. Are you familiar Bill. with Daniel Payne's work by A uh, little bit, yeah. So he talks about the three self-determination mm -hmm. theory, but his are mastery, autonomy, and purpose. Yeah. So having that thing, the purpose is having yeah. that thing that you're striving, which you described. Yeah. I'm not just for the good grade, but the good grade so I could do something. Yeah. So he looks at purpose as another piece of the motivation. So yeah. Yeah. I didn't know if you were familiar with that. Yeah, and you know, for those of you who, who haven't uh, read the book or, or heard him speak, um, I would characterize a lot of it as, as being, you know, really challenging that idea of, this time in a work context, I think is a lot of uh, where his, he, he's talking about, is we think, well, why do workers do work in a corporation? Well, they want to get a paycheck. I think, well, not entirely. The paycheck's, paycheck's good, but if you really want to, say, stimulate more uh, people in your corporation having good ideas or going the extra mile, giving them a cash bonus may be less effective than setting some other kinds of conditions, including um, what's, what's the bigger purpose. He talks about, I think, shifting from uh, if, the, if then, kind of if you do this, I'll give you $100 to now that, you know, now that your team has accomplished this, 
this is going to come to you. So um, some interesting shifts there. Yes. Also, another, another way they, I found out that they like to do things is when they have to, they can decide how to work. Decide how to work. Yes, if they want to do in pairs or groups or the whole class, mm -hmm. even the, the dynamic. If they want to have a debate, choosing who is going to be the director of the debate, who is going to be the, who is going to go uh, um, uh, against that um, opinion or in favor of that opinion, they, they love to do that. All right, so that's a really good example besides just the choose a topic of what this can look like. And if you can manage it, why not allow that as a choice? It kind of reminds me in, in research methods that, that I teach, one of the big things is they do have to work in groups. It's a very stressful project. And as you can imagine, this is constantly an issue. So in this course, what I started doing was having a, a big chunk of time devoted to them developing a group contract. And yeah, there was an autonomy piece to that too, which resembles, I think, what you're, what you're describing. And that I, I, you know, I, I said to them, yes, you have to make a contract. And yes, this is what your group is kind of held to. But that contract you know, can have lots of different things in it. And that's up to you. I don't care. So you determine, OK, what do you do if somebody can't make it to lab? Do you text each other? Do you call? What's the timeline? I, get, I don't care, but you have to decide. Um, it, what is the best means of communication among your group? Do you guys like Google Docs? Do you like texting? Do you like Facebook Messenger? And if, you, if and when your group has problems and you come to me about that, well, guess what? We're going to go back and consult this contract. I'm going to do exactly what you could and should do in your group yourself. It doesn't cure all group problems, but it certainly helps. And yeah, now that I think about it, that's an autonomy piece as well. So that's one to think about. And here's, here's another really old and, and classic concept, self-efficacy, which we've now adapted to kind of specialize it for higher education context too. So self-efficacy, just to be really corny, is the little engine that could principle, I do when I think I can. And it makes a huge amount of sense if you think of it as kind of an adaptive aspect of the human mind. Um, if we can see that our efforts, our energy that we put out there is having some kind of an impact. If I do something, something happens. Then I'm going to say, yeah, that's a great investment of my energy. If not, I'm not going to do it. And it really, it's nice to kind of balance that against incentives. So like you could say, Hey, uh, you know, incentives drive behavior? Oh, really? Well, you could come to me and say, I will give you $50,000, Michelle Miller, if you could sing this opera aria by tomorrow. And I would, I would not take that deal, even though $50,000 is a lot of money, because I know that no matter what I do, that I have absolutely no chance. If you said, hey, draft this manuscript by tomorrow, well, maybe, you know, I, I have some self-efficacy there. I feel like I could do that. So if our students don't feel like they can do it, you can throw grade penalties at them all day long, and you may not see motivated behavior. So, um, and this can be, as it is implied by the term, it's specialized to an academic context. So when students feel like, yeah, in this area or in academics in general, here's what I do, this can happen. If I study for this many hours, I'll see this improvement in my grade. Then suddenly we step up. Um, there's uh, some literature on this ego depletion. It's a weird term. It essentially maps onto willpower. Uh, and I think that this has some relevance to what, to what our students struggle with as well. So uh, essentially one of the core concepts here is that um, ego depletion or, or this willpower, the, the ability to kind of make yourself do something that in the short term is harder, <laughs> um, that sort of comes out of a, a limited common bucket, a lot like attention does. So if you pull out of that, if you make a person uh, tired with multiple decisions or having to control themselves, <laughs> like sit in front of a piece of chocolate cake when they're hungry and not eat it. When you do that, they're less able to exert willpower in completely different contexts. Now, there's some question about this, about the replicability. There's a lot of debate about it right now, but I think the concept holds. Yes? So, so I'm just curious about mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah, we got to be. <laughs> Make good decisions. 
Yes, that would be that would be one of those associated concepts. Yes. So, uh, partly I wonder about it because some of mm -hmm. um, some of the programs are night programs, mm -hmm. and so you think about you have students who come into the classroom and they've been working all day, and then they come and they have to do um, three hours of night class. Mm -hmm. Do you have recommendations yeah. about how to handle that? Yeah, I mean night. Night owls are going to be your best, uh, I and mean, we also have these different circadian preferences. For some students, they're feeling fresh and dandy at that, at that point in, in time. But I think for the teacher, especially if, if that's, you know, sometimes you can't change that. If you can't change that, I think at least some compassion and understanding about what's going on um, is really good. To kind of know it's not that these are these students who don't care, uh, they, it's a personal affront. Um, or they're just unmotivated that, yeah, they've, you've kind of drained the gas tank at that point. It's, it's like being tired, but not quite, the, not quite the identical thing. That, yeah, it's going to be harder for them to say, you know, know what, let's revise this project one more time. Or I'm getting impatient with my group member here, but I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to be able to moderate that. All, all those inhibitions are going to be a little bit more relaxed. So, so yeah, that's it's something, one of the things that makes those kinds of situations tough. And I do hear about these as I go around and talk to different people about their programs. I mean, I've heard, oh, we sit them down for eight hours on a weekend, or they do all their classes in this three-day you know, stretch, and it, it starts at six, and it ends at six. And I go, oh, wow. <laughs> That's, I mean, we are human beings and we're gonna behave differently in that sort of a setting. Yeah. So willpower, ego depletion, if we're asking students to, to do the harder thing, that, their ability to do that is really gonna vary depending on, on what they just did. And lastly, mindset. Here, here too, like critical thinking, that's its own you know, two-day workshop, but it's worth refreshing. I think most people have at least heard of, heard of the mindset Okay, right. That, the idea being here that some of this is, is, has to do with your theories of what intelligence is about. And, and here, I, I like it because it has that interaction or intersection between the cognitive and the more emotional or motivational. So it says that students really walk around with these different ideas about why some people do well in school and others don't, or why they're smart or, or not. And those who have the more effort orientation it can really dramatically and radically tran um, transform how you react to something like a test. So for some students, getting a bad grade on a test is motivating. For others, it's profoundly demotivating. Is that anything about them personally or their background? Maybe not. Maybe it has to do with that belief, that one belief, that, oh, hey, that test tell me about talent, and hey, my, my uh, high school English teacher said I was a great writer, so if I got a bad grade, oh no, she was wrong, and now everything's threatened, and the last thing I want to go do is write another paper or revisit this one or go talk to my professor. Somebody believe, who believes that writing, you know, your grade on a paper reflects how hard you worked on it is going to say, oh wow, I got a bad grade on this. I really need to revisit this, go talk to the teacher, etc. And the last piece that, make, that has made this such an important idea is that these are changeable. And they're changeable relatively easily, which does not happen often in human psychology, as you've seen. So by challenging and reflecting on that specific beliefs, you can see that same student act in a very different way going forward in response to things like bad grades or good grades. So, all right. Yep. Throw out there, I'm a co on a research project, mm -hmm. looking specifically at, at a mindset intervention mm -hmm. insight in STEM students. Campus. If anybody is interested in that field, we've got a postdoc who's phenomenal, who's really well versed on what's going on and how to work with students on that topic. So, yeah, you know, I can put you together if you want to. Yeah, it's it, it's been a really hot area, and I think that that's that's a, a good thing. This is this is one buzzword that I, I think is going to be around for a while, and it's got sounds like even more research um, underway where people are seeing how does this play out in different different contexts and what can we do about it. So, good stuff. All right. Now, another big kind of development in the area of motivation that I think is intriguing for us, especially those of us who are teaching online, has to do with game design. So, I'm sorry, any chance we could open those doors up? I'm freezing over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's going to be a long hour if we can't. 
Yeah. And we're all breathing. I hope so. I hate wasps. <laughs> All right, so who's heard the buzzword gamification? Most of us, all right. And that's one that, I, I mean, at this point, the, I feel like the term is, is almost meaningless. And that's too bad because there are some really neat things I think we can learn and bring in, especially around the area of engagement and motivation, when we take a good, reflective, and deep look at what makes games game-like which I would argue is not the, the points necessarily or the music or the characters or any of that stuff. It's not superficial. So kind of deep gamification is, is where I would like to see educational technology going in the future. So, you know, out in the, out in the culture, because gamification is, is big, it, it's made its way uh, outside of academia as well. Uh, there's, for example, this, this I, I think it's a great book uh, by Jane McGonigal, who's not a psychologist, but she is uh, a game designer and designs, among other things, what she calls serious games. Games where the, the end point is not necessarily fun or status or anything like that. It's to learn something or to uh, help address a real problem in your life. So she points out a couple of things, which, whoops, which I think that we can all um, <coughs> identify with. So one of, the, one of the things that comes up again and again with people who talk about this stuff really seriously are principles of flow. So once again, how many people are uh, familiar with flow state? Okay, so this is, it's a, it's a great concept. It's been around a long time. Um, and it essentially says that, uh, you know, we have these states, these mental states, where we do things like lose track of time, uh, we don't feel like it's effortful. We find it very engaging and rewarding. That's all great. And those are not magic. They are simply conditions that have to do with, for example, how quickly you're getting feedback. And whether you, uh, it's in this kind of Goldilocks um, space of difficulty. So if it's not too easy, not too hard, and we're getting a lot of feedback, I do this and this happens, um, then we go into flow states. And these can even be really everyday things. Like for me, it's honestly, it's cooking, especially if I'm cooking without a, a child hanging on my, my thigh and screaming. I really <laughs> enjoy the process. And that's how it gets to be 8 o'clock at night and everybody's going, you know, is this going to be done? And I've, I've been sizzling and doing these things because I can say, oh, I did this. Oh, that smelled good. Oh, no, that wasn't good. Um, and I, so I'm getting the feedback. It's not totally routine and easy, but it's not impossible. I've got all that good stuff going on. Games have that, and those conditions can be set. Failure. Okay, so here's another piece of ammunition against the students want points and they want perfect points all the time. So McGonagall points out that gamers love to fail. She says that, that that's what they're in it for. They, they love to do this. But failure works in a very specific way in games. Right? So what happens in a game when I die or whatever, the, that the pigs or the vegetables or whatever it is get me? What happens? Cut, you start over, right? So you start over and that, that start is quick. So, you know, let me read that whole manual that tells me how to play Halo, said nobody ever, right? We just jump in and we start it. A sense of mission. So McGonagall talks about this, and I, th I found that this is kind of thin in a lot of the academic gamification literature. So her, her argument is that people do play things like Halo because they, amazingly enough, get into the mission of defeating these evil aliens. So it's not just, okay, I'm racking up how many kills, but in a really good game, we're all pursuing a higher purpose. Narrative, so some games have stories or characters and that can really carry you along. And that all important kind of transparency, knowing where you stand, okay? So I know where I rank in whether I'm playing chess or, or Halo or something else. So those are some things that we might consider cribbing from professional game designers. And, and actually, here, there's this article as well which um, I, I think is really kind of underrated, but I've been, I've been promoting this one for years, so I think it's great. So what Michelle Dickey does in this article is she just, she provides a taxonomy and a mapping between the, the things, the kind of tricks of the trade that professional game designers use and build in to keep you playing, and she 
points out how those map onto characteristics of engaged learning environments, which we've also kind of known about for years, just to, just to point them out and say, how can we accentuate these? So yeah, all these, some of those map onto uh, McGonagall's and others, others don't quite to the same degree. But things like having um, reasonably challenging but doable tasks. Uh, good games have, have hooks, things that you can work with, things that you can do. There are clear, and, and she calls them compelling standards. Right? No question about how to play this right or play this wrong. This is what you're trying to do. There's affiliation and affirmation. So what do you know, that social component, other people can see how I scored, and that component of choice. All right, so you probably get to make some different choices in a, in a game. If it's a simulation game, you can even choose the kind of earrings your character is wearing. Um, if it's a, a role-playing game or a strategy game and we're working together, we have to figure out how we're going to make our raid. So those are some things that we can build in. We don't, this is not to say we have to build all of them in all the time or that we are always going for a high fun factor. I think even something like a repeatable quiz, even though students are not ever going to say that's fun, it has a few of these components to it. I know right away how I did. I might even be able to, to share that. There's some pretty, pretty clear standards. And if I bombed, I get to try it again. It's not the end of the world. So gamification, yes? I want to ask about the whole failure thing. Yeah. Because my issue is, in higher ed, we try to keep students from failing. Mm -hmm. So they don't understand right. about taking risk and trying things because, like I work in student services, mm -hmm. and we try to do anything we can to keep students from being unsuccessful, from being not successful. Mm -hmm. But part of life is understanding that you're not always gonna, things aren't gonna always work out. Yeah. And how do you deal with adversity? Yeah. And I don't know if young people today can deal with adversity, yeah. which you could find failure or whatever else. Yeah. And I think that's something that's missing that we could be doing is helping them understand what it's like to deal with adversity, failure, mm -hmm. and grow from that. And grow from that. So. Great. So that is a very rich question. Yes. I agree wholeheartedly. And I've been yeah. sitting here thinking about that for <laughs> several minutes. I'm so glad you yeah. brought that up because somebody over there said something about approval and disapproval and how you went to, who said that? Is she in here? I don't think she's in here. She said when she went to the board, how she was looking, oh, yeah. oh there she is over there, how she was looking for that approval or disapproval. And I actually wrote down, do we need disapproval to make approval more valuable oh. um, you know it's kind of goes back to that thing where if everybody gets the trophy then you know what's the point, what's the point? It, yeah I kind of and so I actually wrote another note on here that I have been falling into the habit of giving higher grades more for participation rather than what they've actually done and I think maybe I'm gonna step back from that a little bit and I'm gonna start grading a little more harshly so that it does mean more whenever they do get the better grade. So I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> but, but then how do you bring in that it's not a disaster part? How do you, how do you have the tough, choices. okay, multiple, multiple chances. Chance. Okay. I was gonna say okay. that I think this low stakes versus high stakes is sure. so critical. My son, who's 16 years old, mm -hmm. so you guys might have him in a couple of years, <laughs> comes home with his interim reports and says to me, well, I've got an 89 and it's because in these 47 different quizzes, mm -hmm. I got a 70 here and a here, but it's okay because I'm gonna have more chances, it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. So I think the more chances, the more options and the more low stakes grading, I think can let kids fail and be okay with it. Mm -hmm. He might be just weird. Yeah, let them fail by letting them fail. But they don't think it's okay. And the way our grading system is set up, you know, it's mm -hmm. very individual. It's all about getting that grade. Mm -hmm. um, and you got to have that A if you're going to go to graduate school. Um, mm -hmm. So there are issues there. Mm -hmm. All right, and we've got a comment here. Well, well, retention, right? I mean, like, uh, especially at private university, it's, it's an uh, obsession mm -hmm. we have. And I think it's a good thing that we're trying to make sure that students successfully complete their programs. But we get so obsessed, I think, sometimes with retention that we're doing anything and everything, right? To make sure, you know, okay, Johnny, can, can we walk you to class? Make sure, you know, we had, we had a, a parent at Johnson Wales who at one point called our student affairs dean and said, do you guys have a wake up call service? Cause my, <laughs> cause my son or daughter, I forget which was, what is not showing up for class. I mean, you know, at what point is this like, 
you got to take some of this on. <laughs> yeah, so there, but you're right, there's institutional priorities, there's individual priorities, there's the fact of the matter that you are not going to go to grad school and become the school psychologist if you have a D in research methods. It's not happening. What do you think? Yeah, um, the other thing that, the failure thing, it's hard sometimes. When I look at what I do, grammar is not something I normally grade in my assignments because I figured, you know, that's got to be handled in some other class. Cause, Thank you. But, <laughs> but what I do do, if, it, if I feel that they could take steps, I, I say, you know, I may be willing to give you a point or two if I get confirmation you've worked with the Writing Center and want to resubmit something. And I'm still not really grading grammar myself, but what I'm doing is I'm saying I'm willing to give some points to them if they take these critical and formal steps to try to use university resources to improve themselves. So, you know, whether or not that's kind of great grubbing, I'm not sure, but, you know. I've been immersing myself in the ideas of, sort of game-based learning for a while and trying to build game design principles in, in a deep way into my courses and I struggle with the fact that f with games players get to choose whether to play, what to play, when to play, how long to play, how seriously to play and at school they pick a major and then we say pretty much these are the courses you're going to take, this is when you're going to take them, this is when you have to finish by, this is when you're going to do them, this is how you're going to show performance. Within that structure it's almost impossible to create a truly game-like experience because the autonomy is just not there. And as long as we're stuck with this course semester schedule system we've got, it's awful hard to really do much. Oh, I, 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 you know, on the subject mm -hmm. of failure, I, I stress to my students mm -hmm. all the time, they're not going to learn how they do fail. Because we really don't learn things long term unless we go through the struggle. And it's a full physical, mental, it's, I mean, they've got to struggle. And so one of the things, you know, I. We get to, when we get to Excel, I mean, I have them do assignments that they have no, unless they read the textbook, which I know they're not. So they have no idea how to do it. And then they have to come to class and then I, you know, um, give them some tips on how to do things. And then it's like, okay, and you're never going to forget that. And they're like, no, I won't, you know, because we have to struggle. We have to fail and struggle. If we're doing everything right all the time, what are we doing here? I know everything, right? So I think that concept of failing is, what's wrong with it? Out in your class yeah, Abraham Lincoln. I just had to say that I'm sorry sir but I disagree I think that I think that we every time we do something we're making a choice yes we are telling them you have to take these classes to get that degree however they can choose not to get that degree they can choose to do something else you know every time I take a class I might have to take this class but I can decide whether I'm going to do well on it or whether I'm not and I, I just I, I feel like we are faced with choices and they may not realize they're making choices but they are making choices Choices. Okay. So maybe there's a way to emphasize or highlight or pull out autonomy within what is a, a, a structure that does not inherently support a whole lot of choice. Yeah. All right. But that's, but that's a different perspective that everything, you know, that, that even participating in this set degree program is in a sense a choice. So, all right. So, uh, you know, these, these are obviously really thought-provoking principles. So that's what I think is the good stuff about gamification as a buzzword that we can actually run with. Um, it, here I'm just going to call them suggestions because I think that there is a lot, there is so much going on with motivation. But it, here's just what I'd submit to you. I mean, first off, I think that the best thing we can do for motivation is, is simply to think about it and have a plan, even knowing it's not going to be a perfect or bomb-proof or fully effective plan. Just starting with that is a lot more than most of us were ever taught to do, honestly. So I would like to see, in my ideal world, you know, just like now at least those in the know are starting with learning objectives. Instead of just a list of chapters, we start with, well, I want them to be able to do this and be able to describe that. Well, at least in our heads, if not shared with students, but in our heads, what's our idea of what keeps them moving all the way through? 
And only partial credit if that's A, it's required and there's points because now we know that's, that's the, the least of it. So have in your own brain, why is the student doing this? And you might even, for, if you want to take it up a notch, say, well, where in the semester is their motivation going to start to fall apart? And where could I maybe reserve some of my more powerful stuff and apply it to those areas? And remembering that it's not just students getting tired or just deciding they don't want to do it or just being lazy or you know, having homecoming that weekend. There's also that interplay of, hey, am I getting feedback? Do I feel competent? Do I feel autonomous? Am I connected to others or disconnected to others? So what's the plan and where are the, the pinch points going to be? And when we can make those cheap, relatively easy tweaks to wording to foreground autonomy and really the why. The why. I, that whole start with why message, that's, that's been huge in the corporate world. People saying that's how you get people interested in your product is not, you know, what is it, but why. Uh, that's how we motivate people. So we, we should do that too. Now, I think a lot of us try. It's easier said than, than done. But we're going to, to learn this. You are going to master the difference between reliability and validity. Well, why would I want to do that other than to get my points and pass the course? So why am I doing this? Um, really another kind of mechanical but worthwhile design suggestion is to take this early and often principle. And this is one that we actually require in one form or another in all of our first year learning initiative courses. Um, we, we say that you have to get, start giving students feedback. We, we set an arbitrary kind of two weeks. Within two weeks, you've got to have something back to students, right? Um, even if it's very, very small stakes, it starts to set that tone of, of yeah, we're, we're working in here, all right? I, you know where you stand. If there's a problem or maybe you can't even log into the learning management system, now you know, <laughs> two weeks in, not six weeks in. Um, and having those, again, small stakes assignments, that fits really well, by the way, with self-efficacy theory because that's how I know that, hey, I did something and that mattered. Well, I know when I, I have that opportunity to get that feedback. And the feedback doesn't have to be the pile of grading. Even auto-graded chapter quizzes can start to introduce this into the class. And, and that is also one of the things I, I didn't build in procrastination as its own separate topic. But you know that's, that's part of it, too. And we also know a lot about the conditions that tend to lead to procrastination. Um, and, and that's one, feeling like, hey, there's this one big thing I'm working up to instead of the more bite-sized things. So that. That can help students chug along like the, the little engine that could when you give them that. And you know, if you are in that situation where it's demanding, it's a compressed time course, we're doing it, it's online, and we're doing it in the middle of the night, um, I think that building routines is good too. All right, so you know, we always log in with our discussions on this day, and here's what's expected. From a motivation standpoint, when you have that routine, it's less of a drain on your, on your willpower. I always sit down and do my chapter quiz X time on a Sunday, so that's when I'm going to do it, All right? Is it gonna be perfect? No, but that can be helpful. And I think too, as we talk about incorporating not just these motivational, but these cognitive pieces, these become pretty complex classes. I think somebody referenced, you know, okay, I've got a 17 on this quiz, but a 42 on that one, and an 80, and it'll all work out. I mean, that, that's a lot for students to manage. So I think giving them some, some help, some uh, routinizing some parts of that, and maybe even doing things like helping them in the planning process, helping them stay on top of this stuff um, is good. And it's, a, it's something that becomes necessary as we optimize classes in this way. So those are some of, our, some of the top things. Now I'll wrap up with few words about self-regulated learning. This, this does kind of tie in to this concept, self-regulated learning. And that's when students start to have the ability to, frankly, motivate themselves, but also to make those informed, smart, and effective choices about their own studying. So here's a, um, a, a great and to the point concise book by the uh, eminent Linda Nelson. Um, on self-regulated learning. There's lots of different ways to define it. I, I happen to like her definition of self-regulated learning a lot. So I would like to see more of us building this explicitly into our courses no matter what we're teaching. 
okay? So how do we develop these abilities at the same time as we're developing the skills and the knowledge in our subject area? Attention matters, <laughs> same slide, but yeah, attention matters has a piece on this. So we were trying to get students um, better informed about things like better study strategies, attention, distraction, all that good stuff. But we did end that module with a piece that was more explicitly, and then how do you make those behavioral choices stick? So we dosed them with just a, a few highlights from the literature, because once again, there's a research literature on how people can do this effectively. So we pulled in um, a few tips for them on how to make some behavioral changes stick. And this is going way out of the comfort zone for a lot of faculty, but I'll, I'll suggest that you might want to bring some of these in as well. Here's a, a book, um, it's a total pop psych book, but it's written by one of the, the top researchers in this field of intentional behavioral change, a guy who's participated in and done just dozens and dozens of studies on things like um, people who stop smoking or maintain weight loss over time. That's a big behavioral change, and so we, we actually know a lot about what differentiates the people who succeed from the people who, who never succeed. So his book is called Changeology, and we suggested this to students, and we abstracted a few of his kind of top tips for that as well. So this is a, yet another one of my amateur infographics, but like this is something that I put out to students in one of our first year courses. And this is something you can download. Don't try to read my tiny text here. But what I was trying to do is pull out Norcross's um, idea of the stages that lead up to successful behavioral change. So we have this idea in the culture that, you know, a la Nike, you just do it. You know, one day I woke up and I decided I wasn't going to smoke anymore, and that was it. Well, successful behavioral change usually starts with people thinking about it for a while, reflecting on it. Do I really want to change? Uh, having a plan in place, well, what's going to happen when I go out and my friends are smoking? What am I going to do instead? And they, take, they realize or take into account that they are going to fail and backslide. And they found that actually backsliding doesn't put you back to square one. You're actually a little better off every single time, which is really encouraging and counterintuitive news. So we've at least suggested this to students as in their journey to start being that person who puts the phone in the backpack during class and actually does focus until they're finished with their assignment. I said, well, you know, think about it. Prepare first. Think about what you're going to do if the person next to you is being distracting or class is really slow. What are you, how are you going to cope with that? So giving students the tools and basing those tools in research and not just kind of things we've heard um, I think is, is good. So I'll, before our last application, I'll leave you with, with this set of specifics. So one of the things that we discovered in the course of doing the Attention Matters Project, we had students talking to each other and swapping tips about what are the ways to actually do this. We learned that we, we definitely live in the age of irony because to control all of your apps, there's an app for pretty much everything. So tech helps us with our tech. So there's, there's a whole suite of things. If you really want to get very granular with students and say, hey, let's try some of these. Um, so Freedom is an app. It, it's definitely not free. It is actually kind of expensive, so it's not my favorite one. But it, it's, this is kind of at the top of the line. Freedom, um, like several of these other apps, helps you implement what we would call a pre-commitment strategy in behavioral change. That's where, you know, the you at the beginning of the day with the great intentions and all the energy uh, makes decisions on behalf of the you who's tired and depleted and making bad decisions at the end of the day. So at the beginning of my writing session, I can set freedom to say, all right, my phone is not allowed to do any of these things or visit these websites for this amount of time. And me, 55 minutes from now, is really upset about that, but I, at least I've, I've set conditions that make it more likely that I'll actually stay focused. So freedom can help you control those things. Um, Self-control is actually my favorite. It's a free one for the Mac. And I will always regret not thanking them in the acknowledgment section of Minds Online, because Minds Online would not be a book <laughs> if this didn't exist. Um, because self-control lets you, you set, um, 
uh, a blacklist of different sites that you are not allowed to visit for X amount of time. And you can restart your computer. You can do all kinds of things, and you cannot log on to those. So, you know, choose wisely, <laughs> but you can set anywhere from like a couple of minutes to, to 24 hours where you cannot go to a certain site on, on your laptop, or you can shut it all down if you want. Uh, Cold Turkey does something similar. Now these over here do some different things more geared to the phone. Um, Flipped, uh, Flipped still has some, uh, it's not quite ready for prime time, it has some issues, especially in the iOS. But it allows people to, um, either on their own or socially, like in a class, to agree to flip off. Sorry, that's their word, but um, so we're all not going to use our phones, and it's a little bit better than just switching them off because it will send you know, a message to, to people who text in, and you can make emergency calls and things like that. So we can all kind of agree now is not the time we're going to use our phones. So they were actually for a while trying to gear up an academic project to, to work with professors implementing this, and I'm not quite sure how that came out, but they're trying. Now, pocket points was the big one we learned about in Attention Matters. We had never heard of this before, and students were just telling us all about this. And this is something that your institution has to be participating in it. I'm not totally sure how that works, but a lot of colleges have opted in, and NAU is one of them. So when students are on campus and they turn off their phone during class, they earn spendable points that can be used at local businesses. So if you go around Flagstaff, um, you, you will see at my handy outdoor and kayak store pocket points. I don't know if anybody's earned enough to buy a kayak, but maybe one of these days, <laughs> restaurants will have the little icon. And if you've got them, you can trade them for a burrito. And students just adore this uh, to the point where I was one day I was going to be that cool educator who let's all get our phones and do the educational exercise. And that, that's great, but I hear this, this wail from the back of the class, and this young lady goes, I'm earning pocket points, I can't do it. So, so yeah, they, they can really get into this. And it's the same, same kind of thing. It's, it's still my choice, it's not somebody taking away the phone, it's me taking away my, my own phone for some amount of time just to help me follow through on that resolution. Um, moment is more of a, and there's others like this as well, that just gives you information. You know, out of all the time you spent on your phone, well, first of all, how much time was it, which is an interesting number, and what were you doing? Or you can put something similar on your desktop that says, all right, you spent this much time in Microsoft Word and that much time over on Pinterest. And that's another thing that Norcross and his colleagues talk about, that it also starts with just tracking the behavior because we're oftentimes we don't know or we're not honest about how often we smoke or check email where we shouldn't or, or all these things. So sometimes an information gathering part is, is good too. So it's a bit of a crash course, um, but it has been informative for us. It showed us that students are willing to engage in these questions, um, especially when they do have that autonomy and, and a voice in it. And these, I think, are things that we can, we can flow in to help students kind of pick up the ball from us and then go forth as kind of self-regulated and motivated people. All right, so that's, that's uh, your whirlwind tour of motivation. Once again, let's apply it. And we actually, I, I think uh, in the binders you have a, a part three. Uh, you, you aren't going to need that, so just go to the, the next one that's um, 2B. And what do you know, teaching challenge. You can use your same old friend or try a fresh one. Use some of the concepts from today to talk about addressing that challenge, something to do with motivation. I think we've all got a few in that department. And this time the twist is, I'd also like you to think about what do you need to do or what do you need to have in order for that strategy to succeed? So teaching challenge having to do with motivation, think about a solution and to actually be successful with that solution, what do you need to do or what do you need to have? All right? So I'd love to hear from the, the tables. I didn't make it to, to all of them, but I'd love to hear, again, some of the, the highlights. Problems having to do with motivation, the barriers, and the, crucially, the solutions, the techniques that you want to try or that you've tried and, and you want to share because you found that they worked. Because I heard some of those as well. All right. so.
Who wants to, to throw out some highlights? We have uh, some from our tables. Do you want it? You made it. Um, <laughs> it bounces off your head. Our discussions have nothing to do with lots oh, no. of stuff. But, um, <laughs> oh, no. So my challenge is getting students to inventory their understanding and their skills. Really look at what do I get, what don't I get, and then proactively fill in gaps. Go okay. back and learn stuff. Go get help as opposed mm -hmm. to just kind of passively going along and going under deeper and deeper as the mm -hmm. course goes on. Um, I would like to try putting in some elements of game-like learning. Mm -hmm. I want to do sort of a World of Warcraft kind of thing where they have an inventory of skills and knowledge and they can mm -hmm. see how good they are in the different areas and go level up in something that they're weak <coughs> on. Um, how, of course, is the hard part. I thought of trying to have some self-assessment tools, quizzes mm -hmm. and things they can use to assess what do I know, what do I not know, what do I need to work mm -hmm. on, and then places they can go and fill in gaps and work on things. Mm -hmm. I would love it <clears throat> if there were ways in Canvas to do badging and targeted leveling up of skills and mm -hmm. build that in. I may for now have to let them self-inventory and sort of keep track on their own and not really be able to automate a system around that. Um, mm -hmm. What I'm terrified is that this is going to take a huge amount of time away from other things in the curriculum and in design to just do this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. But on the other hand, if they don't know it, they don't know it. I can't mm -hmm. pretend they know it and go on. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The other thing I have to worry about is what I call the dead frog problem. Um, I tried doing some standards-based grading a while ago, and I chopped my curriculum up into little pieces I could assess and reassess on, mm -hmm. and what I discovered was that, well, is a, the old saying is the joke is like a frog. You can dissect it, but it dies. <laughs> Physics is like a frog. If I cut it up into a bunch of little skills, somehow the integration across the subject dies and how it all fits together into a whole, and it becomes a bunch of little skills to test and retest. And I don't want to go down that path. So all right. I need to identify manageable pieces for them to learn and assess and reassess and self inventory mm -hmm. on, but also not make it just about little pieces of skill. So. Yeah. yeah, to sell it to students is this you know, purely incremental mastery of some different trivial facts when integration is is what's up, up well, I think here. The level bosses are all about in the games. Oh, okay, <coughs> good. So adapting some more, even even more in-depth concepts having to do with games. All right. Let's <laughs> hear from the orange cash box. Well, I just wanted to comment on Ian. Um, and I know that it would be cool to do something really sophisticated. and. Another thing to look at is in Canvas is mastery pathways. I'm not sure the last time I heard about it, it's, it's in modules um, where you can do some branching. Um, but the last time I heard, it, it wasn't totally reliable, but I haven't worked with it extensively. But the other thing is there's a wonderful set of articles. It's not new. Um, Robert Talbert, who was a mathematician, um, wrote a series and it was supposedly on specifications grading but there was a piece of how he, he teaches math but I think his blog was casting out nines and he did a whole series in which he discussed doing problems you know assigning a problems and if if they didn't get it then you know they had to go back through and practice and this kind of thing and then they came back there were certain days when he did testing and students signed up for problems and they were always different, a different problem and they came in and they worked on the problem and if they got it done, then it was done and they got the grade for it. Um, but if they got it wrong, then they went back to study and then when they felt ready again, then they signed up to do this type of problem again and took it. So, but now he had a class of, I, I'm going to say some, something like 34 students. But yeah, if you've got a big class, that's a problem. Um, but just, you might find that series of articles, they're really short because they're blog posts. You might find those interesting. I've read a bunch of that stuff and I've tried some of that. It was a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually wrote a, an SSTL paper about that at one point in my career. Not that it couldn't work, it's just logistically incredibly challenging it is. and it can make students hyper focused on assessment and testing as opposed yep. to and it is again you're right it's the frog joke yeah yep
focus for a moment on that. What do you need to have or to do? Piece, that very, very last question I asked you to reflect on. So what were some of the, what do you need to have or to do in order to be successful carrying this stuff out? We have one canvas. It'd be great if it had a competency or, or badging that was built in and set up. What else? Even if it's not that specific, what do you need to have or do to be successful at this? Mm -hmm. a, a, I mean, a really good inventory of what do students really need to know mm -hmm. beyond the obvious content level. Unpacking the skills, mm -hmm. the Oh, <laughs> hello. Yeah, un un unpacking the various levels of skills and perspectives okay. they need. I think often we we so automated that we don't see it. Yeah. And yep. therefore, I don't see what my students are really struggling with, and therefore, I can't assess it and teach it. Mm -hmm. All right. So the starting point of, of even what are the skills? Okay. So that's one. Do we have another? Um, all right. More comfortable chairs. Okay. We need more comfortable <laughs> chairs. Well, I'm sorry. For yourself. All right. All right, what do we need to have or to do in order to be successful? We've got open, open. <laughs> Who else is open for the catch box? Okay. I would say some kind of metacognitive yeah. exercise on the, on the part of students. Okay. All right. So on students. a regular basis, regular okay. reflection. So debriefing every single activity they do. Okay. All right. So students taking the time to reflect on why, on the on the metacognitive aspects, and to have that be part and parcel of what what they're doing in one course, or maybe even in all courses. Okay. What else do we have? Well, well we talked a little bit about the situation where you have students who really don't want to come into a course, yeah. but uh, uh, you've got them. You got and them. I think that the, one of the things that we talked about was. Um, talking about why it would be relevant for them and okay. you know trying to figure out things that that they would mm -hmm. get into um, that that would be of interest to them mm -hmm. and sort of pulling them along in that way yeah. um, and I think for many many fields you can you can do that yeah. and it presumes having students who have the ability to even reflect and, and make it and decide that I mean, it sounds simple to know what interests you, but maybe our students don't. And no, that's what I was going to say. Oh, okay. I was say exactly, it's having the context. Okay, so having the how context. Does this matter to me, and how can I use that? Okay, and we have two. All right, and we'll bring it to. Yes, go uh, ahead, for Mercedes. Us, for us in Spanish, it's very, it's very important for the students to be motivated to participate in class, okay. to use the language. Uh, and um, sometimes they are very tired. Okay. So you because they're energetic students. So we bring candies, <laughs> okay. um, donuts, yeah. a lot of sugar. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> donuts. 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 No. For, uh, we're typing this, so we said donuts. Okay. <laughs> yes. But but yeah. All right. So you need student energy. Simply put. Um, for I was just going to say this. Maybe it's just for my class, but some of the most successful assignments I have has a level of uh, competition mm -hmm. in them. So I mm -hmm. like a competitive spirit in the class uh, where there's one, quote, winner for that uh, product mm -hmm. that they're presenting or pitching or project for the community. And they assess all of them. They critique all of them. And you cannot stand up in front of a class and pitch it and be mortified. So mm -hmm. everybody pulls their, their best stuff out uh, as a result of those assignments. And I would like to find a way to embed that mm -hmm. in all of <laughs> um, the other assignments because they don't have mm -hmm. that same level of competition when they're just writing to me. So healthy, non-toxic yeah. non competition. And nobody fails, to go back to your idea. It's not a failure thing. Nobody fails at that assignment, mm -hmm. but they do compete. Bonnie, um, is it really yeah. competition or is it, or is it being public or is it both? We, by public, you mean the classroom? They're doing it, yeah. They're, they're doing it. They're doing it in the classroom, yeah. 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 Mm, that yeah. is that. And one more? We've been focusing on what we as individuals do in our own classrooms. I want to go back to the point that was made about students who are unwilling in the class. And that's really a big deal here. 
we're teaching an environment where many to most of our students are taking many to most of their classes unwillingly because it's something they have to check off on the way to a job or a degree. And in addition to pushing against that in our classes, I think we collectively really ought to think a whole lot harder about what we can do about mm -hmm. changing that situation. There is a, an overhaul of the gen ed system that's going to be coming up. This coming year, there's going to be all kinds of discussions on campus going on about that. Um, I personally am apparently on the task force that's going to be running that dog and pony show, and I'm probably going to regret that overly. But this is a really good chance for us to take that issue head on and say, what can we do to make college less of a go check off these boxes experience mm -hmm. for students? Mm -hmm. Because if we can fix that, or at least make mm -hmm. it better, we will have less problems in our classes with mm -hmm. student motivation. Mm -hmm. Wow. Give them surprise. Why the slowest Random, cor uh, random uh, course assignments. Random. Novelty <laughs> and choice. I think um, another uh, thing, too, yeah. is a, it, you know, it, it needs to be a, a school-wide. I mean, we were talking mm -hmm. about high point. We were seeing something mm -hmm. that did their mindset. But I also do them, too, you know, there's um, the seven habits of highly effective people, whatever. Mm -hmm. And they've applied that in these different schools. Mm -hmm. You know, in the entire school, everybody, you know, they get to get all the time. So it's kind of like the whole part of their school buying into it and everybody needs to make donations. Yeah. 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 That's, that's why coming together and putting in the energy you have, that's the great power of doing that as a group. Mm -hmm. And so I thank you so much for everything that you put in to make this successful. And thank you to Amy and her team.